the C class slides to the in class chronic obstructive pulmonary disease lecture. You are responsible for viewing this material prior to class and may also be quizzed or tested on this pre class material. Upon the completion of the presentation, the student will be able to describe the epidemiology and etiology of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. When given a patient case, determine risk factors that place a patient at risk for COPD. And lastly, describe the pathophysiology of COPD, including the presence of an acute exacerbation. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is characterized by persistent airflow limitation that is not fully reversible. This is in contrast to asthma where we typically see airflow limitation reversible upon bronchodilation. This persistent airflow limitation is both chronic and progressive. We see, typically see an enhanced chronic inflammatory response in patients with COPD to noxious particles or gases. As you may already know, cigarette smoking is actually the most common cause of COPD, and we'll discuss some of the other risk factors for the development of the disease later on in this presentation. There's a subset of patients fixed with minimal response to bronchodilator or other appropriate therapies, and for some time, the treatments for COPD had not changed very much. Until recently, there's a renewed interest in some novel therapies with some interesting mechanisms of action for the disease. We'll discuss these in your in-class lecture. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is the fourth leading cause of death in both the U.S. and around the world. In 2004, it accounted for $37.2 billion in healthcare costs. This also translated to $20.9 billion in direct healthcare costs and approximately $16.3 billion of indirect costs of morbidity and mortality. We also see a large number of physician office visits that are attributed to COPD complaints or exacerbations, 1.5 million emergency room visits, and over 700,000 hospitalizations annually. Many of these are preventable. As such, the National Lung, Heart, and Blood Institute, along with the World Health Organization, have formulated joint evidence-based guidelines. These guidelines were first published in 2001, however, have been updated several times since then. The guidelines are entitled the Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease, or better known as the GOLD guidelines. The most recent update to these were in 2012, or excuse me, 2013, and we will actually discuss some of the important points of the guidelines in your in-class lecture. Cigarette smoke, as mentioned previously, is the number one risk factor for the development of the disease. It actually accounts for 80 to 90% of all cases. Approximately 15 to 20% of smokers will develop COPD. So while it's the number one cause of COPD, we only see a proportion of smokers that eventually develop the disease. We also must consider our passive smokers or those who are exposed to smoke secondhand as being at risk for the disease. Although we see a lower risk of pipe and smoke cigar smokers with COPD, there are still ha at a higher risk for those compared to those who are non-smokers. Other exposures can lead to the development of the disease and this includes occupational dust and chemicals. We'll move on to discuss some of the other exposures as well as host factors that may place a patient at risk for the disease. First, let's describe the primary etiology of COPD and therefore airflow limitation. When we look at a patient, such as a smoker or someone being exposed to occupational dust or chemicals, this creates inflammation. The inflammation may lead to small airway disease caused by airway inflammation and airway remodeling. We may also see parenchymal destruction, 
which is the result of a loss of alveolar connections and a decrease in elastic recoil. This ultimately leads to airflow limitation. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is best defined as an inflammatory change that leads to destructive changes. This results in chronic airflow limitation. Inflammation is seen in both the airways, pulmonary vasculature, and lung, lung parenchyma. While we see in asthma, this, the disease is primarily a result of eosinophils, COPD is typically neutrophilic in nature. This also leads to the, re to the release of inflammatory meters of CD8, uh, CD8 lymphocytes and macrophages. We also see inflammatory cells such as TNF-alpha and interleukin-8, as well as leukotriene B4. In a couple of slides, we're going to compare and contrast these cells and mediators to those seen in the development of asthma. First, let's look at some of the risk factors. We've already mentioned that an exposure to environmental tobacco smoke is the number one cause of COPD. However, as I've alluded to earlier, exposure to occupational dust and chemicals can also lead to the disease, and there is some thought that air pollution may also contribute. However, this has not been definitively determined to cause COPD alone. In addition, some patients may have specific host factors that allow them to have a progression or to be exposed to the disease. So patients who have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency um, allows them to have a predisposition to COPD. Uh, this is a small number of patients who have COPD. However, we do see these patients and there are specific therapies for the disease. In addition to this, we also see patients who have host factors such as airway hyperresponsiveness and impaired lung growth. What's interesting to note that is that not all individuals exposed to the same risk factors will develop the disease. So therefore, we determine that it's not just the exposures to the environmental factors. However, host factors play an important role in addition to these factors. As mentioned previously, patients have an enhanced reaction to noxious particles and gases. This ultimately leads, to, ultimately leads to lung inflammation and thereby causing oxidative stress. When we have oxidative stress in the pulmonary tissues, there's a cycle of damage and repair mechanisms that lead to airway remodeling and fibrosis of the lungs thereby leading to COPD pathology. We also see proteinases formed as well in relation to lung inflammation, also contributing to COPD pathology. To describe in a little bit more detail some of the pathophysiologic changes that occur, we can look at different aspects of the disease. So the first thing is pathologic changes, parenchymal changes, vascular changes, and mucus hypersecretion. When looking at pathologic changes, we typically see inflammatory exudates, an increase in goblet cells and mucus glands, an increase in mucus secretion, impaired ciliary motility. There's also a thickening of smooth muscle and connective tissue. Inflammation is typically seen in both the central and peripheral airways. This leads to repeated injury repair and ultimately scarring and fibrosis. We can also see a diffuse airway narrowing in the smaller peripheral airways. All of these pathologic changes ultimately, ultimately lead to a decrease in FEV1 and blood glass abnormalities. Moving on to parenchymal changes, we typically see a change in gas exchange units, such as the alveolar and pulmonary capillaries. In patients uh, who have respiratory bronchial changes, we typically see a central lobular emphysema. Also, in patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, we tend to see more of a pan-lobar emphysema.
Vascular changes occur, thereby thickening of pulmonary vessels are seen, a hypoxic vasoconstriction, endothelial dysfunction of the pulmonary arteries, and ultimately in severe disease, we can see right-sided heart failure. Lastly, looking at mucus hypersecretion, there is an increased number and size of mucus producing cells. These all lead to the ultimate airflow limitation seen in COPD. As I alluded to previously, there are some differences in the cells, mediators, and consequences of both COPD and asthma. In addition to this, there is a major difference in the response to specific treatment. When we look at the cells, in COPD, we typically see more neutrophils, and there's a large increase in macrophages, as well as we see CD8 T lymphocytes. In contrast, in asthma, we typically see eosinophils rather than neutrophils and a smaller increase in macrophages. We also see an increase in CDD4 TH2 lymphocytes as described through the hygiene hypothesis of asthma and an activation of mast cells. There is some differentiation between the inflammatory mediators also seen in the disease. So in COPD, we tend to see the LTB4 IL-8, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. In asthma, we see LTD4, IL-4, IL-5, and as you may recall, many other mediators. The, these two differences ultimately lead to some differences in the consequences of either disease. So in COPD, we tend to see a squamous metaplasia of the epithelium, as well as parenchymal destruction. Whereas in asthma, we see a fragile epithelium and thickening of the basement membrane. Both diseases also have mucous metaplasia as well as glandular enlargement. So when we look at COPD and asthma, there is in fact a difference between the response to specific therapy, including glucocorticosteroids. In COPD, we tend to see a variable effect, whereas we will most definitely inhibit inflammation in the disease process of asthma. So this is actually going to play a very important role when we start to think about what are the treatments for COPD and where glucocorticoids will play in the line of therapy versus where we see this in asthma. And we'll discuss this when we talk about treatment. Another important aspect of the disease is an overall thoracic overinflation. So this is caused by a chronic airflow obstruction, which results in air trapping and ultimately causes a flattening of the diaphragmatic muscles. This flattening results in a negative inspiratory force and ultimately leads to less efficient muscles of ventilation. Some other consequences of thoracic overinflation include a change in lung volumes. So we'll typically see an increase in the functional residual capacity of the lungs, which is the amount of air left in the lungs ex after expiration of quiet breathing. This ultimately then will lead to a decrease in the inspiratory reserve capacity and ultimately dyspnea. So patients will have difficulty breathing as a result of the, the changes in lung volumes. As we discussed in our spirometry lecture, spirometry plays a very important role in the, diagnos the diagnosis as well as determination of therapy of the disease. Airflow limitation is assessed with spirometry for COPD, and there's a hallmark of COPD reduction of FEV1 over FVC less than 70% or less than 0.7. So you'll e see this described as either less than 70% or less than 0.7 in the literature. We also see that FEV1 is also generally re reduced. However, we might not see this reduction in mild disease. When we look at FEV1, the rate of decline is actually greater than that of normal patients. There are some arterial blood gas changes seen in COPD, and this typically will occur when the disease has progressed to some more severe forms. 
There is a normal gas exchange impaired in a protective function of the lung that is impaired in COPD. This actually results in dyspnea and chronic cough with sputum. This abnormal gas exchange will, will result in hypoxemia and hypercapnia. There's not a strong relationship between pulmonary function and ABG results. However, we also don't see a very significant change until FEV1 is less than one liter. In severe cases, cases hypoxemia can lead to pulmonary arterial hypertension. We'll spend a couple minutes talking about the pathophysiology of an acute exacerbation of COPD. Essentially, this is a change in symptoms at baseline. So patients will have an, an increase in dyspnea, cough, or sputum production. This actually may occur more commonly in patients with severe disease. And in the pathophysiology of an acute exacerbation, we'll see inflammatory mediators in the sputum, including neutrophils as well as eosinophils. So unlike just our chronic disease, when we have an acute exacerbation, we see the appearance of some eosinophils. Airflow limitation during exacerbation may actually not be increased. However, we do see that hyperinflation worsens, and this will cause a worsening of dyspnea and poor gas exchange.